All right, guys, I think I finally got Zoom working, so I'll start. Just turn off the lights off the front so you can see a bit better. All right, welcome to the um, HSC booster for um, Earth and Environmental Science. Um, my name's Ed. I'm a lecturer here in geology. Um, my contact details are up here. If you've got any questions about this, feel free to sing out at any time during the lecture. But if nothing comes to you immediately, but then suddenly you wake up in the middle of the night with a question. Oops, sorry, what's happening here? Zoom's playing up. Um, not sure what's going on. All right, hopefully that's working. No one's on Zoom at the moment anyway, but if someone turns up, I thought I'd better turn it on. Yeah, so if you wake up in the middle of the night with a question about any of this stuff, feel free to send me an email and um, I'll try and help you out. So today we're going to be talking about earth and environmental science. My background is I'm a geologist, so I'm focusing much more on, I guess, the geological side, the earth science side of things, rather than the environmental side, uh, side of things. Today's lecture, I'm mostly going to be talking about tectonics. Tectonics is really like our grand unified theory of geology. Um, everything always comes back to tectonics. It doesn't matter what area you work in in geology, you always end up coming back to tectonics. So my background, I work mostly on igneous rocks, like granites and basalts and those sorts of things, volcanism and where volcanoes come from. Uh, but if you talk to, say, a structural geologist or a metamorphic geologist or a sedimentologist or a paleontologist, everything they do always comes back to tectonics. So it's, really, it's a really important sort of idea to get into your head how tectonics works. So this is just a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Like I said, I'm going to be focusing on tectonics. We'll be talking about the plate tectonic theory and about how we know about this theory. So what lines of evidence do we have for the tectonic cycle? So we'll talk about things like the jigsaw fit of the continents, the various fossil assemblages and how they match up across the oceans, uh, the profile of the sea floor. We'll talk about the age of some of the rocks on the sea floor and how they fit in, as well as about the magnetic patterns that we see in these oceanic rift zones. I'll talk a little bit about a model of um, plate tectonics and tectonic supercycles. We'll talk briefly about banded iron formations. Banded iron formations, I heard somebody mention it already, so you guys have obviously covered it a little bit, but they're a really important part of geology because they're one of these um, parts of geology that really link together the various different spheres of the Earth. So we have the atmosphere, we have the hydrosphere, like the oceans and the uh, river waters, the biosphere, you know, the living organisms on the planet, and the geosphere, which is the solid Earth. And that's the stuff that I normally focus on. But these various spheres all interact. There's a really dynamic sort of thing between them. And the banded iron formations are a really good example of the interaction between the geosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. And towards the end of the lecture, I'll talk a little bit about earthquakes and volcanoes and how we can predict these sorts of events. So hopefully you are familiar with the basics of plate tectonics. There are seven major plates on the surface of our planet, and there are several smaller ones. Tectonics is unique to Earth. There's no other planet within our solar system that has an active tectonic cycle. Um, so we really are quite an unusual planet within our solar system. The tectonic plates, as I said, there are seven of these major plates. They're on the surface of the Earth, and these plates are made up of by the lithosphere. So the lithosphere is the upper portion of the solid Earth. It includes the crust, but it also includes the uppermost mantle. We have lithospheric mantle, and that mantle is part of these tectonic plates, the uppermost mantle. So this is solid mantle. It's rigid. It doesn't deform. It doesn't flow. And these lithospheric plates, they're sitting on top of the asthenosphere. And the asthenosphere is the convecting mantle. This is the stuff that moves around, it cycles around, and it causes our tectonic plates to drift backwards and forwards and collide with each other, and all of this active tectonics that we see on the surface of, um, of the planet. It's important to note that the asthenosphere is not a liquid. It's a common mistake. I see people thinking it's flowing, so it must be a liquid. There must be a lot of magma down there. Of course, there is a little bit of magma down there, but it's a tiny portion of the asthenosphere. We're talking about probably less than half a percent. So the asthenosphere really is a solid um, component of our planet. 
And we know this because we have seismic waves that travel through the asthenosphere. And there are certain seismic waves that cannot travel through liquids, yet we see them travelling through our asthenosphere. So we know that it's a solid. It's a solid that flows, but it is a solid. And when I say it flows, it flows pretty slowly. So we're talking about maybe centimetres per year. So it's not exactly racing around. Um, but over geological sorts of time periods, and we're often dealing with millions or even billions of years, that becomes really significant. So it can move a significant distance over these really long sorts of time periods. So that's the basics of tectonics and the basic outline of tectonics on our planet. So when did tectonics start? That's a really good question. It's been a really open question in geology. There's been a lot of debate about it. Some people think it started quite recently. In fact, some people would say that it didn't start pretty much until the end of the Proterozoic, really the last billion or so years. Whereas other people say that we've always had tectonics, or we've had tectonics pretty much since we've had solid crust all the way back about four and a half billion years ago. Most geologists agree that tectonics had at least started by the end of the Archean. That's not universally accepted, but it's certainly the um, prevailing um, theory. It's likely that the Earth formed, these early formed plates that um, occurred on Earth were constantly colliding and breaking up. The difficulty, of course, we have in geology is that we do have a tectonically active planet, and a lot of the evidence from the early Earth has been destroyed by that tectonics. So we're losing a lot of the early history of our planet because these plates have been created, but they've also been destroyed. So we've lost a lot of that early material. The first couple of billion years of our planet's history are really quite poorly known because of that um, tectonic cycle. I've got a little video here that I'll just put onto YouTube. This is a video of a lava lake, and it kind of shows what early, tecto oops, what early tectonics probably looked like. So this is a lava lake, and what we're seeing here is this crust forming up the top of the, the magma. So that magma is solidifying, forming this thin crust, and these are very similar to tectonic plates, just on a much, much smaller scale. You can see these ridges where these things are being pulled apart, and we're creating new plates, and on the boundary around the edges, this is where that material is getting destroyed. This is probably what our early Earth looked like. This is obviously sped up, a much faster sort of um, version of what was going on, but it's a similar sort of idea. We're getting these thin sorts of plates constantly being formed and also being destroyed. And so as a result, we have lost a lot of that information from the, um, the early Earth. Now eventually, at some point in Earth's history, we started forming stable, low-density continental crust. Continental crust is quite different to oceanic crust. Oceanic crust is made mostly out of basalt. Basalt is quite a dense sort of material. In fact, when you cool basalt down, it's denser than the mantle that it's sitting on top of. So it's gravitationally unstable. If you've got something that's more dense sitting on something that's less dense, you're going to end up overturning that. And that's what happens during subduction. That's what the initiation of that subduction is. So um, oceanic crust is quite high density. It will eventually subduct. Continental crust, rather than being made up of basalts, is made up more of things like granites and various felsic um, igneous rocks. These are much lower in their density, and once they're created, they're almost impossible to destroy. So even the continental crust that was formed very early in Earth's history, a lot of that is still present on the surface of the planet today. We've got continental crust that goes back to about 4 billion years old. We've got evidence of continental crust in the form of some very small crystals that formed in a continental environment that goes back to about 4.4 billion years ago. Our planet's probably about 4.5 billion years old, so we've got evidence of continental crust going right back to pretty close to the start of our planet. So the thing about this continental crust is once it's formed, it's very difficult to destroy it. In fact, a lot of the continental crust that we have around the world, about 70% of it, is Archean or older. So we're looking at stuff that's formed in the first couple of billion years of our planet. And with the formation of this continental crust, plate tectonics could begin. So like I said, there is debate about when tectonics actually did start, but it is possible that it could have started all the way back really early in Earth's history. So to put ourselves a little bit in context, this is where we are. We're on the Australia plate. Our country, the boundary of our country, is pretty much within the middle of the plate. So we don't have any active continent, oh, sorry, any active tectonic margins running through our country itself. But we do have a lot of active tectonism going on on the edges of um, the plate that we're on. Up in the north, up here, 
Where's my mouse? There it is. Up here, we've got active collision going on with um, Indonesia as well as New Guinea. We've also got active collisions going on with New Zealand and the Pacific Plate over here. And down the bottom here, we have rifting going on. So that's where these, con uh, these tectonic plates are being pulled apart. The Australia plate is the fastest moving plate on the modern planet. We're moving north about seven centimetres per year. So again, it doesn't sound like much, but if you think about that over 15 or so years, that means we've moved a metre. And when we go over decades or hundreds of years, it means that some of our reference points can actually have moved a significant amount on our planet. So we're often having to update things like our, our grids, our grid reference systems for things like GPS, because the accuracy that we're measuring these things, or the precision that we're measuring these things with, is often sub one metre in, um, in its scale. So the fact that we've moved several metres is actually enough to cause problems with various uh, geological measurements and various geographical measurements on our plate. The reason we're moving so fast, and again, seven centimetres may not sound fast, but over decades or hundreds of years, it's actually quite a rapid rate, is by the push of this, uh, this mid-ocean ridge down here. The pulling apart of that mid-ocean ridge is driving Australia north and pushing us into this active collision zone up with Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. So we've got um, active mountain building processes going on up in the north of our plate. The other thing is, uh, Australia is actually quite a seismically active um, uh, country. Despite the fact that we don't have any plate margins running through our country, we do have a lot of um, earthquakes that go on here for an intraplate, um, an intraplate continent. And the reason for that seismicity, again, is to do with that fast moving nature of our plate and that collision up, the, up in the north. The stress caused by that collision up in the north is transferred back down through the plate and causes earthquakes uh, within these intraplate, um, uh, sorry, intraplate earthquake zones. So how do we know about tectonics? Um, well, there's a number of different lines of evidence that converge on this particular theory. I guess the first one and the most obvious one that was uh, figured out hundreds of years ago is looking at the um, looking at the jigsaw fit of the continents. Once we had good maps of the continents, people were already starting to remark on the fact that these things look like they fit together quite neatly as a jigsaw puzzle. And you can see here the jigsaw puzzle put together of, um, of Gondwana. But it took many years to find other uh, lines of evidence that actually pointed towards this. People said, yes, there's a jigsaw fit, but that doesn't really mean that these uh, plates can move, can move around. Um, the next line of evidence is really looking at the fossil evidence and looking at the fact that there are these land plants and land animals that are present in different, or the fossils of them are present in very different countries, countries that are separated by vast oceans. And how do you get a, a land animal or a land plant actually on these two separate continents that are separated by potentially thousands of kilometres? There's various theories about land bridges and all these sorts of things, but it never really quite fit with what we were, what we were seeing here. So there's these pathways on this particular map, these different coloured pathways, are showing where we have the same animal present in different, um, in different locations. So it's basically the migration path of these, of these animals. So that was the next line of evidence for plate tectonics. All right, coming back to Australia, looking at Australia again, Australia grew from the west to the east. The oldest rocks in Australia by far are over in Western Australia, and things get progressively younger the further east we get within our country. So this is a really basic geological map here of Australia, and the colours indicate different ages of rocks in these different locations. So the green stuff is the really old stuff. These are what we call cratons. Um, these are Archean in age, so two and a half billion years ago or older. And you can see that these green colours are very much concentrated in Western Australia. So we have the Yilgarn Craton here, this nice big one here, the Pilbara Craton up in the north here. There's also little remnants of ancient rock in South Australia as well, the Gawler Craton here. The pinks and yellows, these are Proterozoic rocks. The pinks are Proterozoic uh, mountain belts. They're no longer mountains, they've been eroded away, but they're the cores of ancient mountain belts. And the yellows are Proterozoic basins. So these are places where we've got a significant amount of sedimentary infill. And you can see that these pinks and yellows, these are concentrated very much through central Australia. There's a little bit over in the west, there's a tiny bit towards the east, but very much these are concentrated in the centre of Australia. 
And the blue colours here are the Phanerozoic rocks. So these are the youngest rocks, Cambrian and younger. So we're looking at younger than about 540 million years. So the Proterozoic was two and a half billion years to about 540 million years, and the Phanerozoic was from about 540 million years onwards. And you can see the majority of these are concentrated in eastern Australia. There are little bits and pieces of them scattered through the east and through central Australia, but you can see that most of eastern Australia is Phanerozoic. So these are the youngest parts of Australia. So Australia was really built up from west to east. The Archean stuff, these Archean cratons, these were formed first back in the Archean, 200, uh, sorry, 2,500 million years ago. And then we've had progressive accretion of material onto the east coast of, that, um, of the country. So if we jumped in our time machines, went back 600 million years ago, the eastern Australia basically wouldn't exist. Those rocks hadn't formed yet. They formed in um, subduction zones and they were accreted onto the eastern margin of our continent. Okay, so one thing, one other piece of evidence for tectonics, we've already talked about the jigsaw shape of the, um, of the continents and about how these uh, tracks of animals go across these continents. But another thing is the geology, the rocks actually match up across this jigsaw fit as well. So the colour on here is showing the location of these cratons. So remember, cratons are these really old rocks. They're uh, two and a half billion years or older. And when we match these uh, jigsaws back up, so here we've got Africa and South America matched back up, and we can see that these cratons actually also join along those jigsaw fits as well. So this is another line of evidence for tectonics. Not only do we have that jigsaw fit and that paleontological fit, but also we have these rocks that fit across these, uh, this jigsaw fit. So tectonics has obviously been built up slowly um, over the years. Um, some of the first evidence for what was going on in our oceans came back in the 1900s when they were starting to think about things like laying out um, trans uh, the transatlantic tele uh, telegraph cables, these big telegraph cables that were going across the oceans. And to do that, they needed a pretty good idea about how deep the oceans were. So they went out and they measured the depths of the oceans and they did this by a pretty rudimentary way back then. They basically had a big weight attached to a rope and dropped it off the boat and tried to see how far down the rope got before it went slack. And that gave them an idea about how deep the ocean was. They were expecting a pretty flat bottom across the majority of the ocean. They were expecting it to be a pretty much a uniform depth. But what they found was that there was these mid-oceanic uh, mid mountain belts. So within the middle of these oceans, there's this distinctive ridge. They have these irregular steep-sided mountains and valleys. So this was the first evidence for mid-ocean ridges. They didn't know what they were yet, but they knew that there was this mountain belt that ran through these uh, mid-ocean ridges. As time's gone on, there's been various other um, uh, methods of analysing what's going on in these uh, mid-ocean ridges. Uh, people started to, to notice uh, the magnetic stripes on the sea floor. The Earth's magnetic field periodically reverses itself. So at the moment we have the North Magnetic Pole and the Geographic North Pole lined up, so they're both in the north of our planet. But there are periods of time where we have reverse magnetic polarity, where the North Magnetic Pole is actually coming out at the South Pole of our planet. So it flips backwards and forwards, and this happens over the course of uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years. And the rocks that make up the ocean floor record this. The ocean floor, the oceanic crust, is made mostly out of basalt, as I mentioned before. And most basalts are weakly magnetic. They have a mineral called magnetite in them. And magnetite is quite a magnetic sort of mineral. When you crystallise that magma, so remember it was a fluid of magma, when you crystallise it, those little magnetite um, crystals within it, they line up with the magnetism of the Earth. So they're like little compass arrows, and they'll be pointing to where the North Pole is at the time that those rocks were crystallised. So they'll be pointing towards the North when we have normal magnetic polarity, and they'll be pointing down towards the South when we have reverse magnetic polarity. And we see this within the oceanic rocks being mostly basalts, they're really good at recording this particular information. And we see this very symmetric sort of shape around these mid-ocean ridges. And that's what this figure here is trying to show. So right at the ridge, at this point in time, we're creating rocks that have a normal magnetic polarity. But if you go back to slightly older rocks, rocks that are a bit further away from the ridge, you'll see that they have a reverse magnetic polarity. And this will be symmetric around that ridge. So we have the stripe on this side, and we have that same stripe on this side, on the other side of the ridge. 
And then we go back to a period where we have normal magnetic polarity, and again that is mirrored on the other side of the ridge. So we have this real symmetrical sort of feature around that ridge where we have um, the changes in that magnetic polarity. So that was saying something about these, these rocks basically being a conveyor belt that was spreading away from that ridge. Now another thing that people have done is gone and actually tried to figure out how old the rocks are within um, the ocean basins. These are made out of basalts. Basalts are rocks that we can date through potassium argon or argon argon isotopic techniques. And then we can put together a map of the age of the rocks on the ocean floor. And that's what this coloured map down here is showing. So this line through the middle here, this is our mid-ocean ridge. And these colours indicate how old the rocks are. The hotter the colour, so reds, yellows, these are young rocks. And the colder the colour, things like blues and greens, these are older rocks. So as we get further away from the ridge, you can see symmetrically in both directions, you get into progressively older rocks from quite young right at the ridge. In fact, right on the ridge, they'll be being formed right now. They're being formed today. These are very volcanically active um, parts of the planet. So we'll have rocks forming today. And the further you get away from that ridge, the older those rocks get. The oldest rocks we ever find within the oceans are about 200 million years old. There's old pockets here that get up to, I think, about 260 million years. There's nothing that really will get over 300 million years old in the oceans. That might sound pretty old, but when you compare that to the continents, the continents go back to at least 4,000 million years old. So we're looking at a, more than an order of magnitude older in the continental crust compared to the oceanic crust. And the reason for that, again, is that we're a tectonically active planet. The oceanic crust is a dense material, it's full of basalts, these basalts are really dense and they would love to be put back down into the mantle, they'll sink back down because of that high density and so they're destroyed really easily. At these plate margins where we have uh, this nice low density continental material, so this is a North America craton here and then we have the oceanic plate coming up against that, the oceanic plate is going to go underneath the low density um, continental crust and get completely destroyed. So this is the reason why we don't have any real ancient material from the oceans. Just want to show a real quick video of... So this, this video comes from Sabin Zahirovich at the University of Sydney. And he used all these lines of evidence that we've talked about so far to put back together what the uh, land masses have been doing over time, what the continental plates have been doing over time. So these black lines, these basically represent the tectonic boundaries. And he's used that same information that I've talked about, the jigsaw fit of the continents, the same rocks that we're seeing across the different sides or different countries. Uh, and he used a lot of biogeographical information too. So he was looking at things like uh, different fossil assemblages in different locations. And of course, he had to have all of this material carefully dated. And from that, he could put back together this little video of what our planet has done over the last 200 million years. So I'll just replay that. This is basically Gondwana here. You can see where Australia down here. We're attached to Antarctica here. The uh, west coast is attached to India, and India is attached to Africa and South America. As Gondwana starts breaking up, you can see India start pulling away, as well as Antarctica and Australia from Africa. India then started its movement north. It moved very fast. It moved at about 20 centimetres per year. This is really um, super fast for a tectonic sort of plate. And then collided with Asia at about 40 million years ago. And that started the formation of the Himalayas. Um, so this collision is still actively ongoing. It, India is still pushing its way up into Asia. And those mountains are still going up. But we're at the point now where the mountains are going up and getting eroded at about the same rate. The last part of the breakup of Gondwana was basically Australia and Antarctica. We were hugging onto Antarctica for dear life up until about 50 million years ago when we finally let go. Tasmania finally broke off Antarctica and then we started moving north. So this is that, that mid-ocean ridge eventually forming through here. That is what's pushing our plate towards the north now. So you can see we're still hanging on 90 million years ago, 80 million years ago. And eventually we let go, we start letting go about 60 million years ago. Tasmania holds on till about 50 or 50 to 40 million years ago. And then our plate starts moving north and we start colliding with Indonesia and New Guinea. And so that's basically where we are today. So using all of this information, all these different lines of evidence, we can start making these sorts of models and understanding how our planet has changed over time.
So like I said early on, everything comes back to tectonics. It's so important. And from my background, I'm more interested in igneous rocks. That's what my research tends to focus on and what I'm teaching about most of the time. And of course, all the magmatism that I'm looking at is all closely related to plate tectonics. The various different magmatic products that we see, as well as the eruption styles that we see in the modern day, are all related to that tectonic regime from which they are formed. So that means we can go back in Earth's history, look at what the, the rocks, what the rock record is telling us, and we can use that to start to piece together the past tectonic history of a region. So nothing makes sense in modern geology without plate tectonics. So this is a really basic little cartoon of um, the various different types of tectonic environments, really idealised sort of thing. So this greenish colour, this is oceanic lithosphere. Oh, sorry, this uh, orange colour, this is oceanic crust. This pinkish colour, this is continental crust. And you can see these plates, these oceanic plates, are subducting underneath the continental plates. So we have subduction of ocean under ocean over here, and we have subduction of ocean under continents over here. So there's a bunch of different types of plate tectonic boundary. We really talk about the three main types of plate tectonic boundary. We have divergent plate margins. These are where tectonic plates are being pulled apart, they're being ripped apart. The best example of these is mid-ocean ridges. So that's number one here. So down here, this is that mid-ocean ridge. We already talked a little bit about these. So we have this symmetrical striping on the sea floors away from this mid-ocean ridge, both in terms of its paleomagnetics as well as in terms of the age. At that point, as we have material being pulled apart, something's got to come up to fill that gap. You know, nature doesn't really like having a vacuum, so we have mantle that will flow up to fill that gap. And as that mantle comes up towards the surface, it's really hot and you release that pressure, it starts to melt and it starts to produce these basaltic melts. Basaltic melts pretty much always come from the mantle. And this is one place where we produce these basaltic melts. We can get divergent boundaries in other places as well though. We see it within continental rifts where we have continental crust being ripped apart. The best example of that on the modern earth is the East Africa rift. So this is an idealised example here where we have a continental crust being pulled apart. It stretches, it thins, it sags and we have magmas come up and fill those voids. So again we often get um, basalts forming in that sort of environment. The other place we can get this is in a place called back arc basins. So here we have a volcanic arc. So think about somewhere like the Philippines in the modern day. We've got subduction going under that. As that slab, as that subducting slab pulls back, it's rolling back into the mantle, it pulls the crust above it and starts pulling it apart. And so that's a back arc basin and that's what we're seeing in this little zone here. So these divergent plate boundaries, this is the area where we get the most voluminous igneous activity. These, these divergent plate boundaries, this produces a significant amount of magma each year. By far the majority of the magma currently being produced on Earth is basaltic, and most of it is sitting in the mid-ocean ridges. So although we don't see these volcanoes day to day, because they're under a couple of kilometres of water, this is the area where we're getting the most new volcanic material being created. And we're talking about about 20 cubic kilometres of new crust, oceanic crust being generated each year at these boundaries. But that's not the only type of tectonic boundary. So as well as the divergent boundaries, we've got the convergent boundaries. And this is effectively the opposite. Rather than pulling things apart, we're pushing things together. Uh, so at these sorts of places, this is where we get things like subduction going on. And the two main um, boundaries here are the island arcs and the continental arcs. This is an island arc here where we have oceanic crust and it's subducting under more oceanic crust and it creates these little islands, and those little islands end up being made out of continental crust from the melting that goes on in that process. We can also get continental arcs, where we have uh, oceanic crust subducting underneath a continent. A good example of that in the modern day is the Andes. The Andes, we've got subduction of the Pacific plate going underneath the uh, continent. Yes, a question. Um, how does the oceanic crust subduct under the oceanic crust? That's a, real, that's a really good question. You basically will need two oceanic plates that have different, different ages and therefore different densities, and one will get subducted underneath the other. We see this, um, we see this in places like the Philippines, uh, Japan, uh, and various other places around. So yeah, this subduction of oceanic crust under oceanic crust, probably not as common as under continental crust, but it does indeed incur, occur. Yeah. 
in, in terms of um, their preservation. Yeah. yeah, it depends whether they end up being accreted onto like another um, another margin. Japan is probably going to get smooshed basically onto the edge of Asia, and so it will probably get preserved um, preserved there. We see these oceanic um, islands um, preserved when they get accreted. Most of Eastern Australia was made out of these. So we basically collided them onto the east coast of Australia and built it up that way. But yeah, if they don't collide on there, then they'll get eroded down and will basically disappear. So these areas, these arcs, both island arcs and continental arcs, are um, both still quite, uh, still produce quite a large volume of magma, but a bit less than what we're seeing at these divergent plate boundaries. We're looking at about half as much magma. So about 10, kilom 10 cubic kilometres of new igneous rock each year at these, at these sorts of boundaries. The third kind of plate boundary is um, one that is generally magmatically not active at all. So these are the transform boundaries. This is where we have two tectonic plates basically sliding next to each other. No subduction, no pulling apart, they're just sliding up against each other. These are rarely magmatically active. There's not really any examples on the modern Earth where we see magmatism within these transform boundaries. Um, but they are really important seismic zones. So the best example of these on the modern Earth is the San Andreas Fault in California. All those earthquakes that they get in California are a result of those two plates grinding against each other. There's no active subduction going on there. There's no, nothing being pulled apart. They're just grinding up um, alongside each other. And so we get so a lot of seismic activity but no real volcanic activity as a result of that. You can also get volcanoes that are away from plate boundaries. These are the rarer sorts of examples, but they do occur. And probably the most important example on the modern Earth is the Hawaiian Emperor Chain. So Hawaii is an intraplate volcano. You'll see it sits basically bang on in the middle of the Pacific plate. It's nowhere near a plate boundary. So these form through the process of hotspots. Hotspots are hot material that come up from the core mantle boundary. So they come up through thousands of kilometres of mantle from that core mantle boundary. As solid rock, they'll rise up as diapirs. They get heated basically by, think of a lava lamp, they're getting heated from below, they're getting heated by the core. And as they're heated, they expand and then they start moving up. They move up as solid rock, but once they get close to the surface, that solid rock starts to melt, simply because of the reduction of pressure on that rock. When you reduce the pressure of something, you can cause it to melt. That's what's going on in these hot spots. So they'll usually burn through the crust, being really hot material. They'll burn their way up through the um, oceanic or the continental crust, and they'll produce a volcano. So again, the, the best example on the modern Earth is um, the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian hotspot chain. Um, the hotspots usually are stationary. They will sit in a single spot, and the continental or oceanic crust of the tectonic plate will move over that hotspot and so you'll end up with a nice line of volcanoes as a result of the movement of the tectonic plate over the stationary hotspot. There's plenty of other examples of these hotspots. In fact, if you guys went up the hill just behind us, up the top there, there's basalts. And those basalts are from about 18 million years ago. Um, Australia didn't look that different 18 million years ago. We still weren't sitting on a plate boundary at all. And so all of those volcanics up the hill are from um, hotspot um, magmas. So Australia, Eastern Australia, there's a big hotspot chain that runs from northern Queensland all the way down through this area, all the way down to Victoria and um, South Australia. The most recent expression of that hotspot chain is the Mount Gambier volcano, which is about 5,000 years, um, 5, years ago. And that's right on the Victorian South Australian border. So that's another hotspot, another example of a hotspot. Iceland is also sitting on a hotspot. But Iceland is uh, unusual, it's really unique in the modern Earth, uh, in that it is uh, a hotspot that's also sitting on top of a mid-ocean ridge. So you actually have both processes there going on, both the mid-ocean ridge and a uh, hotspot. This is a picture of um, Iceland. So Iceland is, Iceland is here, and this is the mid-ocean ridge, this line running through here. So you can see Iceland sits basically right on that mid-ocean ridge. And it's really the only place on the modern Earth where that mid-ocean ridge is above sea level. And the reason it's above sea level is because it's also sitting on a hot spot. And that hot spot is causing that buoyancy, it's pushing the plate up, and it's causing that plate to come up and out of the ocean. Normally these mid-ocean ridges, you're looking at depths of a couple of um, kilometres of water, but here we're actually seeing it up on the surface. And here's one of these rifts. So basically this is a modern day uh, plate boundary that we're seeing 
right through here, this rift line. Okay, so tectonic super cycles. This is called the Wilson cycle. This is the process that tectonics goes through periodically. We have this forming and breaking apart of these um, supercontinents. So we go through these supercontinent cycles. Um, the most recent one was Gondwana, but there's a number of other ones that go back through geological history. So at the first stage, you will start out with some you know, nice, stable, ancient sort of crust. So an example of that might be something like South Africa today, or even Australia. Australia's nice, stable sort of, um, sort of ancient crust. And they'll go through some kind of rifting process. So there'll be some kind of force on that. Generally happening at the boundaries, the plate boundaries, you'll be pulling things apart, and that gets transferred into that crust and causes things to start to rift apart. An example of where this rifting has started to initiate is also in Africa, the East African Rift, which is a big rift valley running down the east, eastern margin of um, Africa. And there the crust has been thinned and we're starting to get a lot of magmatism as a result of that thinning. So we're thinning it, it's sinking, it's subsiding and it's getting uh, pulled apart. So this is early rifting. If we go through rifting enough, we transition from what they call rift to drift. Rift to drift is where we go from having continental crust and we start thinning it out so much that we start producing new oceanic crust in there. And this is how we start producing one of these new oceanic basins. So number C here is where we've actually pulled apart the crust enough to actually start producing these, um, this new oceanic crust. The margins of that oceanic crust, you might either have subduction going on there or probably more commonly or in the... Um, uh, Atlantic at least, we've got passive margins actually right around the, um, the rim of that, that ocean. So continuing onwards, you can get then get subduction going on at those edges. We now have continental crust and oceanic crust sitting next to each other. Once that uh, new oceanic crust gets cool enough, starts cooling down, that's going to increase its density and eventually it's going to get to the point where it's gravitationally unstable and it's going to want to subduct back down into the mantle. And so we can get the initiation of this subduction going on and the ocean that we had previously formed is now going to start to close up again. Once that ocean starts to close down, that very last stage, we're talking about Japan just before, Japan is basically, we've got a very quite a thin sort of ocean basin and eventually we're going to have two continents starting to collide. So in this day we're going to have um, uh, Japan and say Asia starting to collide together. This is how a lot of Eastern Australia was built up, like I mentioned before. We had these island arcs that had formed and they eventually got accreted onto the east coast of Australia. You can then have uh, subduction going under that uh, new bit of continental crust, so like we have in the, um, the Andes today, where we've now accreted that continent, oh, sorry, that island arc onto the continental edge. And then finally you'll have the uplift of this material, so we start going through this period of uplift through these accretionary origins, like, what going, what, like what's going on in the Andes today, and that eventually gets eroded down and we form these high but flat sorts of plains. So parts of New Zealand are going through this sort of process at the moment where we've got these high relatively flat sorts of plains. These super cycles, these um, tectonic supercontinents, they influence a lot of different things on our planet. They'll influence things like the climate and they do that through changing things like ocean currents, air currents, rainfall, temperature patterns, um, as well as the formation of new oceans which can change things as well, changing the distribution of land masses, changing the heights of land masses. So tectonics also has a huge influence on our planet, not just in terms of the rocks, but in terms of the biosphere, in terms of the atmosphere, and in terms of the hydrosphere as well. So building these things, we can actually, building these new mountain belts will actually change the planet beyond just the, the, rocky, uh, the rocky planet. So once we build these new mountain ranges, we put a barrier in place for things like uh, air currents. So often on the, uh, the ocean side of these mountain ranges, we'll have these warm, moist air currents. They'll rise up, try and getting over the mountain belt, and to do that, they end up dropping their uh, water content as precipitation. So you'll often find that there's a lot more water on the ocean side of these um, on the ocean side of these mountain belts, or a lot more rainfall, I should say, and it tends to be more desert inland from there.
And we see this in places like the Andes in the, in the modern day. So this is orographic rain, where we have the, the water being precipitated as it moves up and over that mountain range, and then significantly drier uh, inland. We even see this in Australia, on the east coast of Australia, having the water coming up from places like Coffs Harbour. As it comes up the mountain, a lot of that water gets dropped out to make it just up the, the hill there. And it's a lot drier here in Armidale than it is in places like Dorigo, just down the, down the road. And that's a result of a lot of this orographic sort of rain. So these tectonic super cycles will also affect climate as well as, um, as, well as affecting the rocks. So I already mentioned banded iron formations briefly, and I said early on that these are a really good uh, example of the interaction between these different spheres of our planet. So we've got the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the geosphere, and the, the biosphere. So banded iron formations, these are quite ancient sorts of rocks. We don't see them forming past the Proterozoic. Most of these were formed by 1700 million years ago, so back in the Proterozoic, and even further back into the, um, the late Archean, we see these. The story about how these formed um, is really a chemical sort of story. It's to do with the amount of iron that we have within the oceans. Now, some of you might know, if you've done any chemistry, you might know that iron comes in two different oxidation states, or at least in terms of geology, it comes in two different oxidation states. We have iron 2 plus, which we call reduced iron, chemically reduced iron, and iron 3 plus, which we call oxidized iron. Iron 2 plus is very soluble. It's happy to dissolve in seawater. Iron 3 plus is the opposite. It's extremely insoluble. It will not dissolve in seawater at all. As soon as you have an oxidizing atmosphere, so once you've got free oxygen in the atmosphere, any iron 2 plus within the oceans is going to convert into iron 3 plus through the process of oxidation. So anything that was dissolved is going to end up precipitating out as iron 3 plus. The early Earth we know had a very reducing atmosphere. So I'm talking about chemically reducing, had lots of things like methane in there, maybe some carbon dioxide, maybe even free hydrogen as well in there. A nice reducing sort of environment. And as a result, the oceans were also chemically reducing. So they had lots of iron 2 plus, happily dissolved within the oceans. At one point, obviously, life evolved on our planet and life found a really good way of producing energy was through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis, is obviously oxygen. So oxygen was being introduced into the environment in the first time. Having an oxygen-rich atmosphere like we have today, that's not normal. The only reason we have oxygen in our atmosphere is because life on Earth, because of, um, because of uh, photosynthesis. If we killed all life on Earth, we would go back to a reducing atmosphere pretty quickly. It wouldn't remain in our atmosphere. It would all react out. And that's what happened in the early Earth. When we, as soon as we started producing oxygen, we started reacting it with the iron in the seawater, and that caused it to precipitate out as these banded iron formations. So early on, we were producing oxygen, but it wasn't building up in the atmosphere. It was all being lost straight to um, the oxidation of iron and deposited down on the, on the ocean floor. So the biosphere was creating the oxygen. That was putting oxygen into the atmosphere, which was causing oxidation in the hydrosphere, which ultimately was producing new rocks for the geosphere. Really nice interaction between all of these different spheres that was going on here. Here's some pictures of these banded iron formations. These ones are from um, up in the Pilbara, up in the northwest of Australia. I used to work up there many years ago looking for these sorts of things. These are iron ore deposits. A lot of the iron ore that Australia digs up, one of the major commodities on our, in our country, is iron ore. We dig it up, sell it off to places like China and Japan where they will make this into um, steels and various other goods. The colours in this, you can see why they're called banded iron formations, That's, they've got a very strong banding to them. This dark grey material, this is actually the iron, this is the iron oxide, it's almost pure iron oxide here. In this case the mineral is hematite, which is Fe2O3, basically pure iron oxide. The red stuff is jasper, this is chert, it's mostly silica, but it has a little bit of iron in it, which gives it that reddish sort of colour, and the white stuff is much more pure chert. It's basically pure silica with virtually no iron in it. There's a few different theories about how this formed, but one good theory about how this banding kind of formed was that it could be a seasonal sort of thing that was going on. In the warmer sorts of seasons, you'd have more um, uh, productivity, more life, and therefore more photosynthesis, 
when you have more photosynthesis going on, you're producing more oxygen. When you've got more oxygen, you're producing more iron oxides. And so you get these really dark sorts of pure iron oxide layers. During the colder seasons, when there was very little life, producing very little oxygen, you were just uh, depositing these siliceous sediments, things that are abiogenic, things that aren't necessarily related to the living organisms. So that's more like the background sorts of conditions. And the red would be somewhere in between the two. So you would be looking at a period where you've got some photosynthesis and some siliceous material being deposited. So that's one theory for how these things formed. All right, we'll talk a little bit about prediction of various geological disasters. So we'll start off with uh, predicting earthquakes. Earthquakes are notoriously difficult to predict. In fact, I would say that you can't really predict when an earthquake is going to occur. We can statistically say where earthquakes are likely to occur. We know that the majority of earthquakes occur on plate margins, although Australia has a number of earthquakes itself, and we're very much or quite removed from a plate margin. So you still get intraplate um, earthquakes, but the majority of them, and you can see from these dots here, these are all earthquakes, you can see the location is very much concentrated around these tectonic margins. So the Pacific Rim of Fire around this area here, and down around here is one location where we see a significant amount of these, um, these earthquakes occurring. So we know roughly where they all occur. Uh, we can generally say statistically this area will have X many earthquakes over this many years. We might have you know, this many earthquakes over 100 years or whatever. But to actually uh, say when those earthquakes are going to occur is really almost witchcraft. It's, there's no real way of predicting that it's going to happen you know, this week or next week which makes earthquakes really difficult to, um, to predict. So unlike volcanoes, volcanoes are comparatively quite simple to predict. There is often no warning for these impending earthquakes. Seismologists will study the previous seismology of the area, so they'll look at that seismic activity, they'll be looking at the size of the earthquakes as well as the frequency of the earthquakes, and they'll help them pre uh, predict the likelihood of another um, earthquake event. But the Earth isn't perfectly um, rhythmical. You can't say this place is going to have an earthquake every two years like clockwork. You can only say it's going to have you know, maybe 50 earthquakes over the next 100 years. So that makes life a little bit difficult with the prediction of these things. There are some potential um, precursor signs to earthquakes, and these are some of the things that people have used in the past to try and predict these things. You might see things like uh, uplift of the ground surface or the tilt of the ground surface. You can see things like changes in the properties of the rocks. So this includes things like how fast seismic waves move through those rocks, as well as measuring things like the electrical resist resistivity of the rocks. So you've got various geophysical techniques we can try and use. Uh, people look at things like the changes in the water level in wells and dams. Um, there's certain gases that are supposed to uh, precede the uh, earthquake. So things like the release of radon gas from the ground. Uh, some people say behaviour of animals will be a predictor, as well as you can sometimes get uh, smaller foreshocks before the large main earthquake. However, most earthquakes have none of the above, which makes these uh, predictors um, very difficult to, um, to actually use. Like I said, most earthquakes, and we saw on that map before with all the dots along the, um, the plate margins, most earthquakes will occur along these plate boundaries, but not all. And in Australia, we actually see quite a lot of earthquakes, despite the fact that we're a long way from a plate boundary. So here again is a map of our country. Each of these dots represents an earthquake. I can't remember what time period this was over. Um, must be over the last century or so, and the size of the dots um, represents how large those earthquakes are. So we can see that there is quite a lot of um, earthquake activity that has occurred across Australia, and yet we're a long way from a plate boundary. The earthquakes here are, again, very difficult or impossible to predict. We know the cause of them. It's basically that collision with um, uh, Indonesia and uh, Papua New Guinea up to the north. And that stress is um, transferred back down through the crust and uh, will get earthquakes across the country as a result of that. But saying exactly where they'll occur is pretty much impossible. 
These things normally occur on a fault line. Um, these fault lines have often been identified, but there's many thousands of fault lines across the, the country. And to say which one is going to be activated at any particular time is pretty much impossible. Volcanoes. Volcanoes, by comparison, are relatively simple to predict. Uh, in most parts of the world, um, there will be significant monitoring of these volcanoes. They'll be monitored on a daily basis, especially in the wealthier sorts of countries who have the money to do this regular sorts of monitoring of these volcanoes. Uh, there's a number of these symptoms that um, occur prior to a volcanic eruption. So these include the following. You can see the emanations of gas and ash from a central vent. So we have a nice central vent on our volcano. It often will emit uh, a gas or volcanic ash prior to the uh, volcanic event. Um, the gas composition often changes prior to the volcanism as well. So by monitoring the gases that come out of the volcanoes, you can get a bit of an idea about how likely an eruption is. You often will see an increase in the number of shallow earthquakes around the volcano. This is telling you something about the way the magma is moving up through the earth. As it moves up through the earth, it starts fracturing the rocks, and this can cause these seismic events. You often will see things like changes in the shape of the volcano. Again, as that magma is coming up to the surface, it's going to cause it to bulge, and that can change the actual shape of the volcano. I already mentioned this is often a change in the composition of the gas and the fluids that are emitted from the volcano um, prior to eruption. There's changes in various geophysical uh, responses to the rocks around the volcano, so changes in things like magnetic and electric um, response of the rocks from around the volcano. And so you can use these various remote sensing um, data to start to predict whether uh, a volcano is likely to erupt or not. So these volcanoes often wake up from their dormancy in a number of ways. Some volcanoes never sleep, some will regularly just erupt like clockwork. Places like Stromboli, you'll have uh, eruptions going on uh, daily or in fact um, pretty much hourly there, just constantly, constantly spewing out little bits of magma. Same with some of the Hawaiian eruptions, some of those have been continuous over years or even decades. Um, one of the most Obvious ways is to see an increase in gas and ash ejected from the volcano. So this is a pretty obvious uh, sign that it's starting to erupt. Um, also, you can start to melt the ice caps on top of these volcanoes uh, and start producing lahars, which are a type of mud flow. As you have that magma moving up to the surface of the Earth, as it's coming up to the volcanic event, if that volcano is high enough and has a glacier or a snow cap on top of it, uh, that material will start to melt and you can start to produce a, a lahar or a mud flow down these volcanoes. As well as doing this, this um, can start to cause that volcano to wake up, having that melting of that ice cap on top, because you're reducing the pressure on the magma chamber. As you're removing that water, as that water is starting to melt and move down the, um, down the slope, or the mud, as that starts moving down the slope, that's removing a lot of constraining pressure on the magma, which causes it to expand and can cause it to start to erupt. So as the magma does rise up through the chamber, it's going to expand. So the lithostatic pressure is going to be released on it. The lithostatic pressure is the pressure from the rocks above. So we have these rocks that are basically sitting on top of the magma chamber and they're confining it, they're pushing it down. But as that magma starts to find its pathway up to the surface, the amount of rock that's above it is starting to be released. And so the pressure is decreasing. And this uh, can often start the, uh, the eruption process. As you start releasing the pressure on that magma, things like gas can start bubbling out of it. The magma itself will start to expand and it starts to make its path to the surface a little bit more easily. As it moves up, it will start to fracture the rocks around it, and this is what produces these little seismic events. So these shallow seismic events that uh, lead up to the formation, or to the eruption, I should say, of uh, the volcano are a result of that magma moving upwards and fracturing the rock as it comes up. So this will lead to these small earthquakes. So the seismicity will start to increase prior to the eruption uh, from one every few days to up to hundreds per hour uh, just prior to, to the eruption. So seismologists will monitor these increase in earthquakes over time to help um, uh, predict whether the, uh, er the volcano is about to erupt. 
As magma moves up in the magma chamber, it's going to move up into that volcanic vent and this is going to start to change the shape of the volcano. We start getting these bulges in the volcano, the height can start to change. We often start seeing landslides occurring as a result of this because as we're changing the steepness of the slide, sides of those slopes, it's going to cause material to start to be shed off those slopes and start to um, form these landslides. Um, so this can cause these, uh, again, these little seismic events that goes on. The thing is, once you start removing material from, the, um, from that volcanic cone, that's also going to remove some of that confining pressure on that magma chamber, which is what can often cause it to start to erupt. By having these slips of material down the side, you're causing that um, magma to expand, and that's going to cause a further bulge, more material to be released, and eventually hit this critical point where the material just starts getting ejected out of the, uh, the volcano. So monitoring the, the shapes of these volcanoes and the bulges on them can be really important um, for understanding whether the uh, volcano is going to erupt or not. So I, I say a recent example, but this is back in 1980, so before you guys were, were born voluntarily. Um, but relatively recently, geologically speaking, uh, an example of this occurring was uh, in Mount St. Helens in the USA. We had an earthquake swarm that uh, triggered some landslides, reduced the pressure on that um, magma chamber, which is what caused it to, um, to erupt. Um, prior to this, though, seismologists had been monitoring that volcano and they had noticed these signs and most people had been evacuated from the area prior to the event. So it was a well-predicted sort of volcano. As I mentioned, one of the other things that was um, that changes prior to an eruption is what kind of gases and fluids are being released from the volcano prior to eruption. Uh, one um, thing that we often see is an increase in the amount of sulfur, sulfur dioxide that's being emitted from the volcano. Here we have a picture of the uh, fairly famous crater in New Zealand, the White Island Crater. This is the one that erupted a couple of years ago and um, killed, a, killed a number of people on White Island just off uh, um, to the east of New Zealand. Uh, you can see this yellow material all over here. This is sulphur. This is a very active sort of volcano. It's erupted a number of times over the last hundred years, including quite recently. Uh, so it was a quite a dangerous sort of place to be, to be visiting. There's a significant amount of SO2 that's been emitted from that volcano. And this was an indicator that you know, the magma was relatively close to the surface. So you go from seeing things like carbon dioxide and water being emitted to more sulphurous material being emitted just prior to the eruption. And one final thing that we often see is as that magma comes up towards the surface, it's bringing a lot of heat with it, obviously. And this can cause things to, to boil. So things like streams, lakes, even oceans, if it's um, shallow enough, you'll start to see material boiling off that water body as the, uh, the magma gets up close to the surface. And again, this is a good indicator that that volcano is about to erupt. So that's basically the end of what I wanted to say. Are there any questions about anything I've presented or anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot to take in, I know. I went through a lot of material quite fast and some of this is, you know, from lectures that I give here at the uni in first and second year and condensed right down into an hour-long presentation. So there's a lot of information there for you guys to take in. But like I said at the beginning, my contact details are up here. So. If you um, don't have any questions now, that's fine. But if you do have any um, questions you know, for the next few weeks, feel free to drop me a line and I'm happy to try and explain it a bit better if I haven't explained it well enough here. No worries, guys. Thanks for coming along and listening. I'll uh, let you guys get on to your next class. Enjoy, um, enjoy the rest of the booster. Have you guys got more sessions coming up? Or? Yeah, chemistry now. Chemistry? All right. Have fun with that. I'll uh, see you guys. See you guys next time. Thank you very much. No worries. Yeah.